talking today with Jen Smith. And Jen, you were born Ricky. Tell me how it came about that you started to express as a female. The transgender as a term um, is frequently mistaken to mean that, say, if you're a male, that means that you believe that you're a, 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 a female or want to be a female. But that's not what transgender means. Transgender is an umbrella term that encompasses all kinds of different identities and behavior patterns. So drag queens and cross-dressers and uh, gender non-conforming people are all under the, the transgender um, umbrella. Basically, transgender is a form of behavior. Okay, and uh, so anybody who sort of crosses or moves outside traditional gender expectations. So for a male, that would be wearing makeup, it'd be wearing skirts and, you know, uh, maybe long, not, not necessarily, but long hair that's you know, sort of styled in a feminine way and all of this stuff. Um, so that's that's gender. And this is where we need to be careful that we're not confusing the word gender with the word sex. OK, so sex is a biological reference. OK, it's either male or female, man or woman. Gender is um, basically roles and expectations expectations that are placed upon a sex within a particular uh, community. So I never um, got confused into uh, a state where I was believing that I could be a female uh, or that uh, even I should. I mean, maybe I flirted with it times in my life, but to me it was always just sort of a, a form of expression. So I expressed in feminine ways, and part of that had to do with the fact that I uh, have been bisexual in my life, and um, because I would say because I was a very sort of re wounded, rejected child when I was young, uh, I sort of stumbled into transgender identity uh, in my life and discovered that it was a way that I got a lot of um, positive feedback, particularly from males. So when I was young, I began experimenting with it extensively, and I found that um, I became very popular. And um, I eventually got into, and I don't always talk about this, I got into sex work and stuff. And so I sort of fell into it uh, sort of more uh, completely at that time. Um, so transgender behavior, I would say, is not, uh, not necessarily, it can be, it's not necessarily believing that you're female. It's crossing those gender boundaries and maybe taking on some of the roles of a female. And that's what I've done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's my recollection that when you were in one of the foster homes you were that there was a, an older foster sister that was really cool sort of a 70s uh, rebel girl and uh, always had an entourage of people around her and seemed pretty popular was that sort of a key influence in the direction that you took later that's when i first began flirting with it okay so and that uh, sort of links in with one of my sort of central uh, theses in terms of what i believe is going on with the whole transgender phenomenon particularly with children is the fact that i was a, a foster child who went through six different uh, homes by the time i was emancipated and uh, of course uh, when you go through that as a kid you feel very uh, rejected uh, and like you don't belong anywhere. And uh, when you add to that the kind of vicious bullying that I experienced in, in school, pretty much through all of my time in school, you have a child who feels rejected by the whole world. Okay, so I just felt I didn't belong anywhere. And yes, I had this foster sister in one of my uh, the homes that I lived in who was super popular. She was like one of those 1970s bad girls with the miniskirts. And yeah, I had this whole entourage. And so when I uh, sort of compared my what I regarded to be kind of miserable life to hers, it seemed like she was living in this uh, bubble of perpetual positive energy. And that's when I sort of began sort of envisioning myself in that role, right? Maybe I could be the popular one. So I began experimenting with dressing up and, and stuff like that. And I got very sort of reckless and brave when I was very young. I would like uh, get dressed up in some of like her mini skirts and stuff. And I would actually go out walking around town. So uh, stuff that you'd even sort of, categorizes, uh, you know, quasi dangerous behavior for, for a kid that young. Um, but it, it sort of speaks to the fact that, um, and we see this over and over again, that so many of the kids who are expressing as and, and identifying as transgender are these rejected kids who are looking for new identities. Mm -hmm. So you essentially became a transgender who was against the transgender agenda, if it's fair to say. Uh, if you don't think I've characterized that correctly, you can let me know. But how did that process come about? Okay, so like I say, I'm kind of old school, so I'm 55 now. So I've been around the block on this issue for a very long time. And I've had uh, sort of uh, extensive interactions with the community presenting 
as transgender. And again, that for me, that just means expressing in feminine ways in the world, interacting with guys and, uh, you know, having, uh, you know, uh, sexual relations and stuff with, with, with guys and that type of thing. So I came to have sort of a different understanding of what it meant to be transgender. To me, it was just a form of, of expressing in the world and interacting in the world. Um, but it was never about changing uh, sex. I didn't think that that was possible, right? And when I looked at uh, what was happening with the whole transgender phenomenon, and I got into this about, uh, let's see, 2021, like four years I've been in this uh, debate. But when I first looked at it, and I saw what was going on in terms of, uh, uh, you know, men taking part in women's sports and uh, men being admitted to women's rape shelters and what was going on in our schools. I went, OK, so this is nuts. OK, this is going too far. It's one thing to uh, express in the world uh, as you like, which I fully support, like anybody um, like there are people who, who I've met who don't like what I do and they think that uh, particularly some Christians, not most Christians, but a few Christians out there think that what I'm doing is basically sinful, right? Um, and um, my uh, attitude on that is that may be true, but ultimately that's between myself and God or your lack of God, right? So as long as people aren't interfering with somebody else, I don't care. But when you start crossing those lines and you start saying, no, as soon as I put on a skirt and makeup and stuff and start uh, you know, playing that role, that actually transforms me into an actual woman – that's going too far as far as I'm concerned. And the, the sports was one of the sort of real original triggers for me. It was like, okay, you know, this is nuts because males are constructed totally differently than females. And for them to be t partaking in women's sports is just way out of line. And, um, yeah, what's going on in the schools in terms of the indoctrination and stuff. So I just thought that it all it all gone too far. And when I saw what was going on with our kids in terms of them being, in my opinion, uh, preyed upon by, uh, I would argue, pharmaceutical interests, uh, I felt that I had to get involved and basically speak for truth and reality and what I believe to be a healthy expression or as healthy an expression of transgender identity as you can get. Wow. Now, on your blog, Transsanity, you've identified the transgender agenda as sort of a social engineering bordering on mind control. And again, if I've mischaracterized you, you can clarify. But what parallels do you see between those kinds of efforts in history on other issues and what you're seeing now with transgender agenda? Okay, so uh, one of the things that sort of put me on the map on this in this debate uh, uh, globally, like I'm kind of well known in BC on this issue, but uh, initially when I got into this, I was better known outside of Canada, actually, because I wrote an essay called Synanon, the Brainwashing Game and Modern Transgender Activism, which was very popular. Um, and and uh, in that essay, I talked about the Synanon cult that was very big in the United States in the 1960s and 1970s, uh, one of the most uh, powerful cults in, in U.S history. And I made comparisons between transgender activism and the uh, sort of techniques and stuff that they use in that. And, um, um, you know, what happened in, in some of these cults like Synanon. Uh, basically, I think, uh, once again, what you're seeing is that you've got very vulnerable uh, people. So cults do that too. People who are sort of wounded, emotionally lost, looking for some sort of direction in their life. Uh, same thing with transgender. It's all these wounded people and they're all being offered sort of a, a new life. But there's tactics that they use too. So um, Synanon used something called gaming. So in gaming, they basically would tell you that everything is wrong with you, right? Uh, and that uh, you need a, to completely rework your life and become a whole new being. But they would pelt people with insults and tear them down until they finally rejected their old self and were essentially born again and uh, would uh, sort of begin re-scripting their life in a proper way. And uh, you see this uh, in the transgender phenomenon, but it tends to be a little different. So... For me, I didn't need that outside influence. I mean, I did have it, but I didn't need so much an outside influence telling me that there was everything wrong with me. I was kind of telling myself that. So I was tearing myself down um, from the inside. And then these sort of outside influences, uh, and we see this again today, these outside influences come into these people who have been torn down and they give them a new identity, some basically a magical way of transforming their lives and becoming something else uh, and sort of uh, being able to leave the old self that they didn't like behind. So that's very common. They also go after the family. 
So um, uh, Dr. Rachel McKinnon, who is a professor at uh, Charleston uh, College, I believe it is in the United States, who uh, recently won, and uh, Rachel was born male, just like me, and won the women's uh, cycling champ, one of the women's cycling championships in the United States. And uh, but but Rachel also talks to transgender youths online, and Rachel made this video where uh, he came on and said, uh, speaking directly to transgender youths, if you feel like your parents aren't uh, uh, accepting you and what you're doing, uh, you don't need uh, your parents. You can just uh, forget about your parents and we will be your new family. We will be your glitter family. So just don't worry about those uh, people who aren't accepting you. Walk away from your family and come to us. Okay, this is standard cult brainwashing stuff, right? To separate use from their families or anybody who doesn't support them and to bring them into the cult. Um, and some of this takes place in school. What's happening in schools with, uh, say, Soji123, for instance, is a little more subtle because they, what they're doing is they're just planting these ideas and romancing uh, children with these sort of subtle uh, ideas that they can change sex if they're not happy with themselves. But once they mm -hmm. sort of lock onto that idea, then you've got all these external forces that they'll encounter, say, in the gay-straight alliances and some of these other groups and uh, who uh, will get involved and sort of reinforce them in, in their sort of new concept of what they are or what they uh, think they want to be. Right. Wow. Now, when you're looking at what's going on with foster care as someone who was in the foster system, uh, what's concerning you there, especially as relates to gender transitioning? Okay, so this actually is a, an interesting thing, and a lot of my Christian supporters kind of uh, lock in on this thing because there's almost like a cosmic thing that was at work here. So I decided to get into this debate, as I said, uh, nearly four years ago. But when I got in, I was primarily focusing uh, initially on the um, violation of women's rights and stuff, right? And I slowly began looking at uh, the educational issues, but when I first got into it, I wasn't aware of what was going on with foster kids. But I have this background, right? So I have went through all these different foster homes and stuff. So I came in with this background. I got fully involved, sort of fully uh, qualified and educated in the debate. And then after I became sort of a figure, then I became aware of what was going on with Dr. Uh, Wallace Wong. So Dr. Wallace Wong is the uh, leading gender doctor in British Columbia who handles the greatest number of what they call gender dysphoric kids. So these are kids who, say, young boys who uh, are behaving in feminine ways or think they might be the opposite sex or that type of thing. So he gave a talk, and uh, in that talk he, he told people that he had a 1,000 patients altogether, so a thousand kids uh, in his care. Um, a thousand kids in his care, um, some as young as two and a half years old, by the way, two and a half years Ooh. old, uh, gender dysphoric, and that's from him, right, his, his own words. So, um, but in that talk there, he said half of his kids, 500 of his kids came, 500 came from um, the uh, Ministry of Child and Family Development. Okay, so they're foster kids. They're kids in unstable housing situations, basically wounded children who are um, uh, under the care of the government of British Columbia in some way, right? So mm -hmm. um, now we don't know exactly how these numbers break down, and we won't know until we get a government inquiry, which is I've been trying to do for two years. I've been trying to get a national and provincial inquiries into what's going on. But presuming these numbers are correct, that 500 number, that's half uh, uh, of his patients. And when I heard that, I was like, okay, I was alarmed. I was like, there's no way half of his patients should be from basically the foster care system. And um, I tried to communicate with uh, Dr. Wallace Wong about this, and he didn't want to communicate with me. I ended up to talking to one of his uh, lawyers by proxy, and that's a whole story in itself. But basically, his, his lawyer said, well, Dr. Wong has a special relationship with the uh, Ministry of Child and Family uh, Development, so there's nothing unusual about that. It's just the relationship he has that feeds all these kids to him specifically. Um, that sounds like sort of a convenient way of writing it off. The problem is, is when you take that 500 number, 
right? 500 kids. And you compare that number to the total number of children in the care of uh, the province of British Columbia, it constitutes 7.7% of all children in government care are uh, identifying as gender dysphoric and being treated as, you know, potential candidates for gender transitioning and stuff. 7.7%. Now, in the general population, it is estimated that around 1 in 200 people identify as transgender. For 7.7% of all of these foster kids to be identifying as transgender and under the care of one doctor is startling. Right. When I saw that number and I did the number crunching on that, I was like mortified and I was uh, that would sort of uh, put me into overdrive, if you will, in terms of, okay, we need inquiries. We need to figure out what's going on here. This looks to me like a, a predatory uh, pharmaceutical system that is feeding on these vulnerable kids and turning them into lifelong um, uh, pharmaceutical customers and sterilizing and castrating them chemically in the process. So it's a very serious issue, and it's been very difficult for me to get this information out to the public because the media doesn't want to hear it. The mainstream media doesn't want to hear it. And um, uh, every attempt has been made to try to shut me down and prevent this information from getting out to the public. But it's a very serious issue and one that's very dear to my heart. And like I say, it's coincidental that I would become sort of one of the leading spokesmen on this and then it, to suddenly uh, be, become focused on foster kids. Wow, and now we have the sexual orientation gender identity, SOGI 123, not quite a curriculum, but almost functioning like one in the BC school system. What do you, uh, this, I mean, the idea purportedly is to stop bullying, but there's a lot more going on there. Uh, what do you, what's your assessment of SOGI 123, and what do you think would be, uh, what would be your way of dealing with bullying in schools? So I would say SOGI 123, uh, you're right, it's not a curriculum, it's a curriculum resource, but it's uh, in many ways it's much more insidious than a curriculum because if you look at the uh, the recommendations that come out of the ARC Foundation and the uh, the government regarding SOGI 123, teachers are instructed to try to use this resource pool as much as they can in every grade and every subject from kindergarten through to grade 12. So basically they want this uh, material saturating the curriculum, right? But what, what makes it kind of insidious is it's impossible to track. Right, because it's entirely up to the teachers in terms of what they want to use, or they can use it um, extensively, or they can not use it at all. It's really up to them, right? So we can't even track what's going on with this. We just hear, hear some sort of um, secondary reports coming back from time to time about materials that are being presented. Now we've actually looked at the resource pool, and we know what's there. And uh, yes, the official line on that is that it is designed to essentially normalize all of these different sort of sexual orientations and gender identities in order to reduce uh, bullying. But the, the, the problem that I've had with that is, uh, first of all, we've got these vulnerable kids. So people need to understand it's not just an issue of foster kids, okay? So Wallace Wong has 7.7% of the foster kids, but he's just one doctor, right? It's not unreasonable to assume that maybe as high as one in 10 kids in government care are identifying as transgender compared to one in 200, okay? And if you look at autism, okay, so autistic kids, once again, they're in the regular population, they estimate that 1.7%, yeah, 1.7% of all children present on the autism spectrum. That's according to the CDC in the United States. When you look at studies that have been done on um, transgender kids, the studies vary uh, across the board, but they uh, uh, found that... Um, uh, from the low end, it's uh, estimated that 8% uh, up to as high as 54% in some studies of kids uh, who are transgender present on the autism spectrum between 8% at the low end and 54% at the high end. Let's say it's in the middle, 30%, right? So again, that would be startling information, even if you look at the low end, right? So you go with the low end, the 8%, that's like, uh, you know, more four or five times higher than the general population. Okay, why is that happening? Well, that's back to my whole thing, that they're romanticizing these kids with these ideas. They're vulnerable kids. They're, uh, uh, in the case of autism, kids who are prone to sort of obsessing on things and, uh, you know, locking into unusual behavior patterns and stuff, and the foster kids looking for a new identity. So I believe that it's very dangerous to be putting these ideas out there and um, um, resulting in this, especially when you've got the affirmation model that falls into line in 
uh, after they sort of uh, start saying, okay, I'm, I'm the opposite sex or something, the school sort of kicks in and they start supporting their new identity. And then they get referred to uh, counselors and the counselors will refer them to doctors. And then the next thing you know, they're on this um, – uh, a train that's taking them towards all of these drugs and stuff. And it's even worse because here in uh, BC, actually, I think most places have similar legislation, but here in BC, we've got something called the BC Infants Act, which um, basically tramples parental rights. So I've been working extensively with a father here in British Columbia whose daughter started identifying uh, as the opposite sex uh, because or largely influenced by some of the materials she encountered in schools, particularly a video where she watched this uh, young girl, a video about a young girl who identified as a boy and then cut off all her hair and started living life as a boy. Well, after she saw that video, she went home and cut off all her hair and she started identifying as a boy. Now, the father played along with that for a bit, right? And said, okay, it doesn't seem too harmless. But then at some point, she wanted to get the testosterone a therapy, which is very serious uh, uh, move because it gives girls like facial hair and body hair mm. and gives them a deeper voice. And these are irreversible um, side effects from from using testosterone. And he said, well, no, that's going too far. Right. So I'm not, that's something that you can decide to do when you're an adult. OK, so I'm the adult here and it's uh, my decision as your guardian and your parent that you should wait till you're an adult to make that decision. Well, uh, the, the, uh, a doctor became involved in that. I'm not allowed to say which doctor because I'm under court order not to do so. I understand. But, yeah, he became, he became involved, and basically the BC Children's Hospital uh, became involved as well. And they basically told the father, listen, you don't have any uh, parental rights in this instance. Your daughter wants to get the uh, testosterone therapy. Uh, uh, we're going to start her and schedule her for testosterone therapy, and you must uh, sort of facilitate that. And he tried to protest it in court, and the courts basically supported the uh, Children's Hospital. So parental rights on this matter are eroded too in that process. So that is the danger of SOG-1-2. Two, three is that it's putting these dangerous ideas out there, romancing these vulnerable kids, and then setting them on this this train towards uh, disaster. In my opinion, but uh, of course the 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 cry from the other side is that it is to reduce bullying, and specifically, you'll hear this over and over again. It's to reduce um, suicide. That if these uh, kids aren't uh, reinforced in their new identity, that they might kill themselves or something. Um, the stats on that are, I don't know if you want to get into that, but the stats on that are highly suspect. Um, but um, for bullying, you know, I believe that, the, I mean, there's all kinds of ways that you can reduce bullying. You don't have to sort of normalize every sexual orientation and gender identity under the sun in order to reduce bullying, particularly when you know. And I would say when they know damn well that many of the ideas that they're placing into the minds of these kids uh, conflict with the traditional uh, religious and moral values of many parents, right? And we've had this, uh, um, you know, discussion for decades, really, about things like sex ed and stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And um, the fact that, um, you know, I would say that Christians, even though I'm not a Christian myself, I've sort of uh, defended their, their right to have these values and stuff, and they don't want their kids being taught, like, all of these things to do with changing gender and uh, anal sex and, and all of that stuff. They say, you know, we don't want to trample anybody else's right to do that, but just don't go teaching our kids this. And I support that, right? So... Um, my idea about reducing bullying would have to do with um, using some of the modern technology. I think most parents today would fully endorse, uh, for instance, having surveillance cameras and stuff in school, not in private areas, of course, but just in general areas to try to reduce bullying. Because I know when I was bullied as a kid, I was frequently – I remember one time I was assaulted in the hallway. A bully came up to me and kicked me in the groin uh, in the hallway. If there were security cameras in the hallway – he wouldn't have done that, right, because I could have uh, uh, held him accountable. So I think there are other ways to do that where you just want to uh, teach kids to, you know, not bully anybody ever for any reason and not get into all of this sort of let's normalize everything. Well, it's to recall that in one of your speeches that there was some instance that you had maybe when you were about 12 or so, and I might be wrong on the age, but there was somebody who a couple of guys that were picking on you when the teacher was out of the room and – a uh, female student in the class just rose to your defense. Yeah. It, yeah. If you could recount that, because I think you said really it's as simple as having someone speak up. 
Yeah, that is, was that's, that's something that really sort of always stuck in my mind uh, from my experiences as a kid being bullied. It was because um, these bullies can be so vicious, and I've never sort of tried to, uh, you know, diminish or um, uh, try to reduce the significance of the kind of damage that can be done by bullying on a regular basis. Like I was actually physically insulted and stuff when I was a kid by bullies. But the worst thing that they did to me was the con constant, relentless uh, dehumanization and belittlement that they uh, sort of showered me with constantly, like every day, week after week, month after month, year after year, never ending. So they sort of stripped me of any sort of sense of, uh, of self worth. So that can be very brutal on a kid. Now, I remember um, in one, uh, I believe it was a social studies class. I forget what grade it was. It was uh, maybe in junior high. Um, but I was in the classroom and the teacher had left the classroom and I was sitting up at the front with a bunch of bullies and they just started going off on me like bullies did, calling me names, telling me how hideous I was and what a you know, how disgusting it was to have me in the room and how pathetic I was. And they were just sort of laying into me. And there was this one girl in the back of the room, I guess, who was watching this. And she, she was a type of girl who didn't really ever speak up about anything for the most part. She was very quiet, sort of kept to herself and stuff. And she was watching this, and I guess she started getting mad. And at some point, she just leaped up out of her uh, uh, seat, and she said, won't you just leave him alone? He's never done anything to you. Leave him alone. She did in this big, booming voice that sort of surprised everybody, right? And what do you think happened? They stopped bullying. I get Right? Everything just sort of settled down, and they let it go. So all it took was this one girl to stand up and say, stop, and it stopped. For some reason, that reminds me of the female policewoman in Police Academy where she'd say, excuse me, excuse me. And then she said, freeze, dirtbag. <laughs> yeah, it was like that. She was a very quiet person normally. And that was one of the things that shocked everybody because obviously she was very upset by what she was seeing. Right. And it was like, OK, I've had enough. This has gone too far. And so, yeah, that's it. I mean, teaching um, the you know, like uh, other uh, students and stuff that, you know, uh, it's not just about um, you not bullying. It's about you not tolerating other people uh, being bullied and saying something. When you see something that you know is wrong, speak up and you know tell people that it's not okay. So there's lots of different ways to address bullying. When somebody in your situation who says, you know, Rachel is a male uh, and you acknowledge your biological sex even while you identify as a female or present as a female, you say, look, I'm a male. Uh, sometimes when people detransition, uh, they get a backlash from the LGBT community. How has it been for you as you've taken this stance? Who's lining up against you and maybe who is siding with you, whether openly or quietly? <laughs> well, when you're talking about the LGBTQ community, who isn't lining up against me? That might be a better question. It'd be a shorter list. So I've been um, sort of besieged. And uh, if you look at my election campaign page, which we haven't really got into, but if you look at my election campaign page, there's like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of comments from, from people in the LGBT community who are just calling me every name in the book and uh, lying about me and doing everything. Uh, I think that... Um, yeah, detransitioners are uh, a threat to the uh, the transgender community because they, you know, are suggesting that you know there are maybe drawbacks to this, and it's not all sort of uh, roses and rainbows and butterflies and stuff. So they're a threat. I would say that I'm maybe even more of a threat because I'm not technically technically um, detransitioned. What I am is I have a totally different view of what transgender is, and I would argue as I mentioned earlier, that I think I have a healthier view. So express as you want, but um, accept your biological sex, right? And don't go out sort of demanding everybody else surrender uh, reality and truth, which is exactly what's happening. They're demanding people surrender reality. And there is sort of an insidious, uh, unreasonable uh, quality to that, right? So um, the fact that I do this, and I do it kind of relentlessly, right? So they will come at me and they will say, that's a uh, Morgan Oje. I don't know if people know who Morgan Oje is. Morgan Oje is a, uh, somebody born male who now identifies as a woman who's a very prominent 
prominent uh, uh, activist. And I will say that um, in public, I won't refer to Morgan Auger as a woman ever. And uh, I said this on Twitter, actually. I said that I will never refer to Morgan Auger as a uh, woman uh, in public when it matters. Never. And I was permanently suspended from Twitter for saying that. Permanently. And, and they were aggressive about making sure I didn't try to create new accounts and stuff. But because I take that firm line, and I don't believe it's an insult, okay? So I don't believe speaking the truth when it matters, okay? There's, so there's a, what we call sort of um, shared important truths, and there's little truths that don't matter. So it doesn't uh, – it may be true that I'm not particularly attractive, right? You may think that I'm not attractive. So that may be a true thing, but you don't have to tell me that, right? But when we get into important truths like whether or not I'm a man or a woman – Okay, that's a different thing, especially when you start getting into how it affects policies and stuff like that, right? So I believe that on important things like that, I have to cling to the truth. And I've had waves of transgender activists and LGBT uh, people, and people can go to my uh, YouTube channel, and they'll find video footage of hundreds of uh, these protesters descending on me, right? And just showering me with all of this stuff, demanding that I... Um, release this hold on truth that I have, right? But to me, it's like, okay, so a man is not a woman, okay? I cannot be a woman. That is true. You want me to surrender that, but I can't surrender that because truth is important. And so they keep coming at me, but I will not let it go. And I think we all need to hold on to these truths because the moment you start surrendering one truth, how many others are going to fall behind it? It makes me think about conversion therapy as well, where you have very vague definitions of what it is, and people are not sure if these laws go through, if they're really free anymore to say to a person who maybe, especially even one of their own children, look, you really are male or you really are female. This is your biology. What are your thoughts about this anti-conversion therapy legislative train that seems to be also coming down the tracks. Okay, so I would say that the first thing to sort of understand about me and my perception of what's going on in the world today is um, anybody who's seen my public talks will know that one of the central things in my uh, public talks is I've got a whole section on conflicts of interest with the pharmaceutical industry and the science, the science of transgender uh, identity. And uh, so I would say that transgen or, um, the pharmaceutical industry has its paws all over almost everything transgender because they stand to make billions of dollars off of it. And if anybody is confused uh, for even a moment into thinking that the, the pharmaceutical industry would just keep their hands off and stand back, okay, you need to think again. Okay. So when we're talking about anything related to uh, particularly the T in LGBT, you need to sort of keep in your mind that the pharmaceutical industry is in the background. So let's get into conversion therapy. So my experiences with conversion therapy is that when you talk to most people about it, they have this sort of antiquated notion of conversion therapy. And the first thing that pops into their mind is some gay guy strapped to a table with electrodes hooked up to his testicles or something, right? And he's being zapped every time he has a, you know, a forbidden thought. Right. So that's what most people think of when they think uh, conversion therapy. So when somebody goes to them and say, are you opposed to conversion therapy? They say, well, of course I am. Like who would support that? So like uh, something out of the dark ages or something. Right. So they have this sort of uh, uh, distorted notion of what it is. Now, my feelings on conversion therapy is that. Again, this gets into whether or not we truly support diversity. Okay, so a lot of these LGBT programs that claim to be promoting diversity, I would say, actually are promoting a monoculture and a singular interpretation of um, how to regard um, human sexuality, for instance, right? And they are sort of saying, you know, excluding, say, traditional, say, evangelical type uh, Christian views and stuff and saying, no, these are unacceptable and stuff. But that's not very inclusive, right? Whether you agree with uh, some of the sort of uh, more hardcore, say, evangelical views on homosexuality or not is immaterial. We're supposed to be a diverse society. We respect that. As long as they're not actually hurting somebody, they have to be free to be allowed to uh, believe that. So um, a lot of this is going to be in the language. Okay. So yes, we can all agree that we don't want anybody hooked up to electrodes and stuff. I think we can all agree to that. So, but the language, if you're going to put a law in place, um, is going to have to be very clear about that type of thing. Now, when we talk about um, 
the whole talk therapy thing. Okay, so here is where we get into questions of diversity. So I believe that parents should always be allowed to talk their kids uh, in a caring, respectful way, right, about what their beliefs are and why they might believe that certain forms of behavior are right or wrong. Parents have to uh, be allowed to do that. And even the United Nations said that uh, parents should be the first educators of children. So that used to be sort of like an enshrined right. So we should be very careful at any any moves towards trying to um, censor parents in their relationship with their children in terms of uh, uh, religious and moral uh, and, uh, you know, even like sexual identity questions and stuff like that. We have to give them as much room as possible. And whereas we're talking about many different religious cultures in the world, like most, uh, the, the largest majority in, in Canada uh, uh, or the largest demographic are people who have religious values of one sort or another. Okay, it's the largest single block in Canada. Okay, you can't uh, sort of uh, dismiss what they believe outright uh, in favor of of a minority. What you want to do is make sure that majority is not sort of uh, victimizing a minority, but you don't want the minority victimizing and trampling upon the majority either, right? So we have to allow people to believe what they want. But the, I was actually just talking about this uh, last night at uh, one of my uh, campaign meetings with a bunch of people on the question of conversion therapy, that I do realize that uh, just as I was talking about bullying, that words can be very damaging, okay? So you can uh, get situations where even a parent can just viciously tear apart and cause serious harm to their child using words, right? So, um, but that extends beyond the question of uh, sexuality. That can go, you know, any number of, of directions. So it's all going to be in the language. So I don't know how other people might feel about this, but do we... Do we want to sort of concede that it is possible for a parent to be sort of psychologically abusive to a child and that there are limits to that and limits to which they shouldn't go beyond? So, again, it's going to require very careful phraseology. So you can say, yes, you can talk about your values and say what's right or wrong, but we don't want you traumatizing uh, a child in one way or the other. Uh, but right now, the language that I've seen for these conversion therapy uh, bills are way too vague, right? Yeah. Now, you are running for office now, and tell me what's motivating you to be running in Victoria Swan Lake in the provincial election as an independent. Okay, so this kind of part of this sort of relates uh, to the fact that I, I was just talking about that I've been sort of besieged by the LGBTQ community. And in that process, um, I've had my freedom of speech trampled over and over again. I'm, uh, I would argue. Uh, if you look at events like what happened to me at Oak Bay, if you go Jen Smith and Oak Bay and watch and see what happened to me at Oak Bay, this may be one of the most, um, the best example of cancel culture run amok in Canada. I mean, here you have a transgender speaker who's being besieged by hundreds of LGBT, uh, LGBTQ protesters who want to shut me down and prevent me from speaking. And all I was really saying was that I believe in truth and that I believe that we shouldn't be transitioning these kids. And yet I was besieged by all these attempts to shut me down and lies and stuff being told about me. This happened at UBC as well. So um, part of this comes out of the fact that I have had such uh, trouble getting a... Um, a platform and being heard. The media won't sort of uh, address anything that, that uh, or any of my concerns, even though I've got all this sort of controversy swirling around me. You'd think they'd be interested, but they do their best to sort of ignore me. So I figured that, okay, in tradition with, uh, uh, you know, Canadian democracy going back uh, a long, long time, um, independence and small parties frequently will enter elections to become part of the uh, democratic process, not exclusively to win, and you'd like to win, right? But not exclusively to win, but just to bring certain issues onto the table, okay? So that yeah. is a big part of what I'm doing. It's not the only part, because what has happened to me over the last uh, three or four years, I think is indicative of some very serious problems in our society that really need to be addressed. So I chose Victoria Swan Lake because that is the um, uh, riding of the uh, Minister of Education in British Columbia. That's uh, Rob Fleming. And of course, I'm sort of uh, a prominent anti soj 123 activist in BC. So I felt that would be a good place for me to run and uh, to be 
able to sort of drag our minister of education into uh, public debates, hope, hopefully. If not, at least put the issues on the table and have them put out there in a way that the media can't completely ignore. And this is a very interesting thing about the whole election process. Um, we now have uh, newspapers here who are uh, publishing some of my positions uh, on uh, in regards to um, – uh, child transitioning and all of this stuff that previously, literally, I could not pay them to publish. I would go to them with, with stories, and my uh, campaign manager, too, would go to them with stories, and we would uh, you know, offer to pay big money to have them publish the story. And they said, no, we don't want your money. We're not publishing that, right? Now, right. The, because of election law, they kind of don't have any choice, right? They have to give everybody sort of uh, equal space, right? And so this has enabled me to get my message out there. So my this is like a sort of a message to other sort of uh, people who are frustrated if their issues are not sort of being addressed by society in a meaningful way. Well, you know, take that next step and maybe get involved in the uh, democratic process and run as a candidate because it frees up all kinds of opportunities for you. And that was a big part of what I'm doing. But again, uh, a lot of it has to do with the fact that uh, so the, the father who is being forced to transition his uh, daughter, this is yes. to me a sign that uh, society is slipping into uh, or dangerously close to uh, a lot of totalitarian controls where the government is stepping way over the line. And I think that this needs to be a uh, dialed back and a lot of these freedoms need to be reclaimed uh, by society and the role that big pharma has played in all of this i think is another indication of the problem that uh, we have a lot of uh, influences in uh, government today that need to be expunged and um, yeah so i mean but a whole bunch of things now they have to give you a platform but uh, it's my understanding that the Chamber of Commerce in Victoria did not allow you to speak at an all-candidates debate in your riding. So what was their rationale? Okay, so this is where it starts getting a little complicated. So a newspaper is sort of under different guidelines than, say, a Chamber of Commerce would be, right? So a newspaper, if they're publishing information on candidates, they have to be balanced and they have to give everybody equal space. When it comes to something like the Chamber of Commerce, it's a little more complicated um, because, you know, in some ridings, you can get like uh, seven candidates or, or something, right? And then if somebody who's hosting a debate, uh, anybody who's tried to organize a debate knows that once you start sort of organizing the time, the more candidates you get, the longer the debate comes or becomes. So they've got sort of a, a plausible justification for excluding people to keep the debate uh, as short as possible for their interests, right? And they're not technically um, paying um, to uh, or providing something that normally people would have to pay for. Uh, for publicity, it's just uh, something that they're doing. So they've got sort of some wiggle room there. But uh, people have contacted them and said that um, what they have done in this case is for that riding, there's actually five candidates. So there's the, the big parties, there's the NDP, there's the Greens, there's the Liberals, the big three. Uh, then there's myself. And there's actually a Communist Party candidate in that riding as well. Now, um, when they announced that they were doing this um, uh, debate for that uh, riding, which is tomorrow, actually, uh, they only announced the, the big three. I went out after them sort of right away and said, hey, look, I'm a candidate. I was, you know, I went through all of the hoops. I got all of the signatures from people in the riding and everything. Uh, I'm a legitimate candidate. I want to be part of this debate. And it's not like they've got this massive list of, of candidates and they couldn't fit me in. But they said, no, no, we've, we've decided that uh, we just want to hear from uh, the main three parties. But that, to me, is... Um, is prejudicing the uh, establishment parties, right? So uh, I have very real concerns, and I have citizens who back me on these concerns, and uh, I believe that I deserve a, uh, an equal space at the table, but uh, because of the way the laws are structured, they are able to uh, exclude me. Mm. Well, now, who is getting behind your campaign? Who's supporting you? Okay, so this is interesting. Um this might not be so for other people who might run as independent candidates, they might not have the same experience as me because I was a bit of a public figure before I got into this. And I'm fairly well known in the Victoria area because of some of these things like what happened at uh, UB or um, Oak Bay. And um, I've done some other uh, talks in Victoria that uh, had a lot of protests and stuff, too. So I'm 
fairly uh, well known in certain circles in that community. So when I decided, and it was uh, an interesting thing because I actually was planning on running in this election next year, right? And I was anticipating I was going to have a year to get ready. And then boom, we've got this uh, stamp election called here in British Columbia. And suddenly I'm like, whoa, <laughs> this is awful quick. And it's like uh, basically, you know, what was it, four weeks away from the time that they that they announced it. And by the time I made the decision to, to get involved, I really had three weeks to work with and only like about two weeks before um, the mail-in votes were happening. And anybody who's done this, you try to um, uh, arrange all of your advertising and your flyers and going back and forth with printers and stuff. That all takes a lot of time. So people were mailing in their their uh, votes before we were even fully uh, prepared. So it's been sort of very uh, difficult in that process. But fortunately, because uh, I am sort of uh, or have a, a bit of profile in the area and people know who I am, there are circles uh, behind the scenes um, mainly, frankly, Christian, uh, who know that in that riding there is like uh, uh, it's it's what you might call a left stronghold. So the Green Party and the NDP took up something like eighty over eighty percent of the vote in the last election. So I'm going into hostile territory there, right? There's not much of a conservative voice there. Um, so they saw that I was coming in and they were like, wow, this is great. So I had some very sort of motivated people come up, uh, behind the scenes and say, listen, we want to support you any way we can. So they started mobilizing behind me and very quickly I had a very, uh, productive and motivated team who were out there doing things, drumming up, uh, donations so we could pay for the, uh, financing and all of that stuff. And I had, uh, um, canvassers on the ground. Um, I was worried that I wasn't going to be able get the signatures because you need 75 uh, nomination signatures from the riding in order to run as a as a candidate that might not sound like a lot but when you've got a very short time we had like basically a week to get these signatures um, that can be a real tr uh, a struggle but fortunately we got some motivated people who got out there and they got the signatures basically in about 48 hours we had a hundred signatures to nominate me but that was uh, just sort of fate bringing a lot of good people together who are very motivated to get me onto the ballot, uh, and uh, I will have to give uh, a lot of credit to the Christian community, but people should keep in mind that uh, my support extends beyond the Christian community. I have a lot of feminists behind me as well who are very concerned what's happening with women's rights and that type of thing, and um, so, yeah. So, yeah, so the, um, I guess the Megan Murphy types would be definitely behind you, a woman is a woman. But why do you think the Christian community supports you? What are the sort of issues that you're finding common ground on where they want to get behind you? Well, I mean, this is back to the the, the uh, traditional values and the right to have traditional values and the fact that programs such as SOGI 123 are uh, many Christians feel, not all, but many Christians feel are trampling their right to believe what they want and to raise their children the way they want. And they also believe, much like me, that this sort of uh, chemical uh, castration and sterilization of children is fundamentally wrong, right? And people... Mm -hmm like to sort of demonize the Christian community, um, especially people in the LGBTQ community like to demonize Christians. But um, my experience is that the vast majority of Christians are just good, decent, moral people, right? And they've got, um, they, like, they want to be, <laughs> uh, you know, loving people and, and stuff like that. And the characterizations of them that we've been seeing more and more in society are, are really unfair. So they're just good people who care about children. They don't want children being sterilized. They want to protect their rights as as, uh, you know, to, to raise their kids the way they want, not have the public school system trampling what they believe and uh, trying to respect the, you know, them a little more. So when somebody like me comes along, who's, you know, from the LGBT community and, um, you know, I'm not, not Christian myself, but I was raised in Christian homes, so I'm very sympathetic to Christians. Uh, it was maybe a natural uh, thing for them to want to get behind me, particularly in this riding, like I say, where it was such a, a leftist uh, uh, um, stronghold. That's actually an interesting part of this whole election. So I don't know if you know who Laura Lynn Tyler Thompson is. She's a um, um, former uh, People's Party of Canada candidate, uh, TV uh, evangelist, uh, Christian personality and stuff. She's running in Abbotsford South, and she picked Abbotsford South because it's one of the most conservative uh, areas in uh, British Columbia, at least on the mainland, right? And it gave her her best chance to win. Um, but what she encounters when she goes into a riding like this is people not wanting, like people who you might think should support her 
actually not supporting her because they're saying, listen, it's going to split the vote. We feel that the the uh, the Liberal Party, uh, the Liberal Party in BC, by the way, is a lot different than the uh, federal Liberals. They're more sort of conservative leaning, not completely, but <laughs> more conservative than than say the uh, federal Liberals. So you you encounter this uh, vote splitting argument in 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 a riding like this, and she has to deal with that and loses a lot of votes because of that. When I go into a, a left leaning stronghold like uh, like uh, Victoria Sto- Swan Lake, I mean I hear mm-hmm. those questions every now and then, but it's not really a valid argument. So I keep telling people, listen, if you're not voting for the NDP, Rob Fleming has uh, basically been there for 16 years. He's looking to go on for 20 every election he gets more and more votes i say if you're not voting for the ndp you're throwing your vote away so you vote for me and you make you can make your vote count for something in terms of uh, sending a message to uh the government so um that is has actually um sort of um worked uh, in my uh favor i mean I, again the, the, the timeline here has been so short that um we'll see what happens out of this but <sighs> talk to me about this COVID thing and how you feel that voices are being silenced and, and that it's a very strange time for the independent schools or distance learning to have their funding cut. You could speak to that. Well, this is another one of the questions that I was hoping to ask uh, uh, Rob Fleming if we got into a debate is that um, so one of my, my things with uh, running as a, an independent is I believe that party politics is um, – ultimately bad for democracy because we've got things like party discipline where um, you've got parties telling uh, uh, um, members of of the legislature or whatever that they can't vote their conscience. They need to vote with whatever the party is going for, right? And I think that's anti-democratic. And, of course, there's all the the money interests and stuff behind uh, the scenes uh, as well. Um, But uh, the sort of the agenda thing and the fact that there are agendas uh, behind the scenes that uh, supersede the interests of the public and doing what is right, uh, I think, was never more clear than what is happening with IDL funding. And for people who don't know, that's basically a form of uh, homeschooling where kids are uh, out of the public school system, and yet they're still being educated by certified teachers. So it's a proper education and stuff, right? Now, you would think during the COVID-19 thing, where they're trying to uh, keep students apart and make maximum use of space and, uh, you know, where you can get uh, students out of the school, uh, that, that's, a, that's a good thing to try to reduce the spread of the uh, of the pandemic. But what do they do with uh, with IDL, which helps with that by taking kids out of the school and educating them at home or, or wherever outside of the public school system and educating them properly? What do they do with them? Right in the middle of the pandemic, they cut their funding by, I think it was 21%. So now they only get half of the funding that a child gets who goes to a public school. So they're actually making it harder to do that. Now, why would you do that in the middle of a pandemic? Right. The only reason you can think of them doing that is there's some sort of agenda behind the scene that is far more important to them than public health. Even what might that agenda be? Is it to undermine parental authority or religious instruction or what do you think it actually could be? When I first got into this debate, when I wrote my first essay, the Synanon essay, uh, almost four years ago now, one of the first things I observed is that there appeared to be in this movement a totalitarian underbelly. And uh, you see that with SOGI 123 and the fact that uh, when they created SOGI 123, they did not consult at all the largest single demographic in British Columbia, which is the Christian community. Okay, In a democratic society where you're coming up with a, a, an educational resource as pervasive and as intrusive as Soji 123, how does it happen that you completely ignore your largest demographic? Okay, the only way to sort of uh, justify that is particularly when you look at the fact that it is sort of trampling on Christian values and beliefs, is that there is a totalitarian impulse here. Uh, and uh, I think we see this with, uh, you know, so many people around the globe saying that we're into a global reset right now and that they're sort of looking to re-envision humanity. Well, I think that part of that, and I've seen this coming for some time now, is that uh, like every totalitarian society and history, they understand the importance of getting control of the minds of children, right? And indoctrinating them and making sure that the children of the next generation are all schooled completely in the ideology of the establishment and that you don't have any troublesome, meddlesome outsiders messing with the new indoctrination. 
Well, when we think about SOGI 123 and how you describe it as a perspective that pervades every class, it does really seem like a worldview is being imposed. I'm wondering, given that you've been demonized by your opponents, and yet you're running in a left-wing area and an area that's been strongly taught to accept transgender people, you're knocking on the doors, looking as you do. What's the reaction been like at the doors or has door-to-door canvassing in the time of COVID been something you've been able to do? We've been able to do it. So when we go to a door, uh, typically what we do is we'll knock and we'll stand back uh, six feet, right? So that we've got Mm -hmm. social distancing outside. So that hasn't been a big problem. I haven't encountered a single person in the time that I was canvassing there who was complaining about no mask, right? Most of them came to the door without a mask. So um, that hasn't really been a a big issue as long as you keep your space, right? Um, In terms of the reaction that I'm getting at the door, and this is not just my experience, but experience from other people who have been canvassing from me it's been surprisingly positive and a lot of that has to do with the fact that people are unaware of some of the information that that i'm platforming uh on right and when they Mm -hmm. hear the information when they hear another perspective they're like like i've had a lot of people like when i talk about the the fact that one of my main platform items is i'm trying to um get a a provincial and national inquiries into the medical transitioning of of kids particularly uh, vulnerable kids when i give them some of the quick stats on that there's a lot of drop jaw I was like, why have I never heard this before, right? And when they understand that, and of course, they're, sometimes they'll be like, okay, so that's quite a claim. I don't know if I believe you. So I'll refer them to my video. I've got a video, uh, like a 15-minute video, where I lay everything out and sort of document everything for my call for a national inquiry. So I tell them to go look at that. But when they understand sort of the platforms and they understand that I'm, you know, I'm not a bigot and um, – You'd think that that would be obvious, but it's not always obvious, right, uh, to people. They'll, they'll. Uh, I mean, well, I've got transgender people who call me a transphobe, right? But um, for the most part, the reactions have actually been surprisingly strong. And for me to get positive reactions uh, at the door uh, in what is a left uh, stronghold is is hopeful. And it sort of reinforces what I believe is that, and, and I've seen this in my public talks. So I've done public talks across British Columbia for two and a half, three years now, all across the province. And uh, in the the process of those talks, what I found is that frequently people would come to my talks who um, assumed that I was a hater and a bigot and all these terrible things that people say about me, all these lies that people tell about me. So they figured that I was a hater and a bigot and they're going to come to my talk. And then during the question and answer period, they're going to give me the what for and expose me for the terrible monster that I am, right? But when they come to the talk and they listen to what I present and they listen to all the statistics and data, I've had people repeatedly come up to me and and say, you know, I came here to uh, expose you and to confront you as a bigot, but the thing that's going through my mind right now is why have I never heard this before? Why have I never heard any of this information before? And so they are converted. My conversion ratio with people who are either, um, you know, coming in with skewed notions about what I am or who are neutral is very high. And that's because the information is very powerful. So whether we're talking door to door or whether we're talking my public talks, I believe that the problem right now is getting good information to people when you get good information to people, most good people will make the right decision. Mm hmm. Well, we're almost at the end of an hour. Is there anything that you would like to talk about or say as we close with regards to establishment politics versus what you're doing or any aspect of the issues that we've talked about that maybe I haven't asked you? Well, I mean, uh, what I would say is that um, I think that... um, Maybe what I'm doing is kind of instructive for other people who are frustrated with society and coming to understand that it's not enough to sort of complain about society and, uh, you know, maybe even just like it's it's good that I get support and stuff, but it's, it's, it's not enough. Uh, people have to actually get up and do something, right? This has been a lot of work for me uh, running in this. I mean, everything I've done over the last <laughs> three, four years has been a lot of work for me. And I don't know that I expect everybody to do that, but everybody can do something. So I would hope that people, if they feel that there's something wrong with their society today and they feel that things are out of control, don't just sort of sit back and complain about it. You need to get up and, and do something, you know, 
there are people on the front lines uh, that you support, well, then go out and, and support them. The only thing that sometimes concerns me is that um, we need to understand that the people that we're trying to convert ultimately are the middle undecided. So Edward L. Bernays, who was one of the great sort of... Uh, I guess you call them propagandists in 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 human history, but he also worked on um, uh, three different, I believe it was three different presidential campaigns. And he said that whenever you're trying to uh, win an election or win public opinion in any sort of regard, your target audience is not those who already support you and, and not the radical opponents of you. Your target is the middle. Okay, so whatever arguments you you stage and whatever methods you use to try to go out and raise public awareness and get people on your side, you need to remember you are focusing on the middle and they're very sort of uh, they just want to live their lives. They don't want a lot of fuss and stuff. So you need to go at them with as balanced and control the message as possible and try to keep the the, the sort of the really crazy stuff uh, out of it as much as possible. So the main thing is just to, for people to, to get involved or support those who are getting involved and um, support my national uh, quest for a national inquiry too. If you go to my uh, jensmith.ca, there's a link there for national inquiry where you can go to the government site and sign the inquiry so we can get an investigation into what's happening with these kids. And that's Jen Smith with two N's. Thank you so much for talking with me today. This has been a real pleasure. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Lee.